Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Otis. My name is Rachel Wilkins. Happy Friday, everybody. I am delighted this morning. I got a wonderful guest joining me, the wonderful Ron Smith. Ron is originally from Louisiana, uh, in Louisiana still right now. Uh, we actually met in uh, Dallas, Texas uh, a couple of years ago, and Ron is a mixed media artist. So welcome, Ron. It's great to have you here this morning. It's good to be here. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me to participate. It's such a pleasure. Um, so you are a mixed media artist. You do a variety of different techniques and styles, but you're also a graphic designer as well. So my, my first kind of question is, how are you managing, first of all, this, this pandemic? Has it impacted you creatively? I mean, obviously, work-wise, I imagine it's a little bit of a hit, but how are you navigating this? Uh, what I've done uh, purposely, the pandemic really made me pay more attention to my art in how I actually promote it. Because before then, I didn't I didn't particularly like social media, uh, but I realized most of my sales are through Instagram. Mm. So I've, I've had to make sure that I'm keeping up on the Instagram side, probably more so than my website. It's amazing. Because wow. to me, I thought my website would drive my sales, but actually it's really my Instagram page that actually drives my sales. So what I've done is taken that time to focus on what I need to do to actually build my brand. And it's a great time to do that, I think, as we do have this kind of gift of time somewhat where we can, you know, just get organized, right, in preparation. Right. <laughs> and that's actually what I've done. I've spent more time doing this. Being a graphic designer, I need to do some of that anyway. And sometimes right. that transcends into other things. But it's, it's really pushed me to uh, uh, make my face new more so because I'm really kind of, you know, looking more hard, but I won't talk about it, you know, so right. that changed. So. That's awesome. So yeah, we were just chatting before we jumped on. You um, showed at our Dallas show, um, engaged with um, the work that you're putting out. Um, tell us how that experience was for you. First of all, I hadn't planned to even uh, try to do a show. Mm -hmm. And at the last minute, I was searching one night and saw Conception North. I'm like, let me try. All of a sudden, the next day I get a response saying, hey, we like to, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I only had like 10 days. Wow. So I wanted to, okay. I was that last person, but uh, that actually helped me springboard into the mindset that maybe I can make a living at this. Mm -hmm. so, so conception pushed me in a manner that uh, I hadn't been pushed on my own. So I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity that, that you guys gave me to, to kind of go and grow. That's awesome. Well, we're we're that's glad to have you as part of this crazy conception family. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I it's a great family, though. It's a great family. It, yeah, we we there's a lot of love out there, that's for sure. So I wanted to talk about you. One of the quotes that I when I was doing my research, I found that you referred to art as a reflection of your past, your present, and your future. So I thought that would be a good way for us to kind of construct this conversation this morning, that we could talk a little bit about your early days growing up. Yeah. And you grew up in rural Belcher, Louisiana. So tell yeah. us about those early days as a young boy in the South. Well, I always thought I could draw a little bit. So I spent a lot of time by myself in the room because I'm the oldest of eight. And my siblings yeah. would always say, I like to spend time to myself with pencil and paper. So in, in Belcher, that's really hard, kind of all we had to do. Uh, there were maybe 250 people, and most of them were my relatives. So, uh, my dad, being a sharecropper in the farm in the farming industry, just gave me a different kind of view as to what my art would be like. Because I just I would just draw airplanes doing uh, crop dusting early on. Then I had a lot of influence from a, a teacher of mine who was not just a musician, but he was also an artist. So I kind of at the age of 10 started to really pay attention to art and really start to like it more. Uh, but art and music, actually, they're both my foundation. And I think because of art and music, uh, those two things creatively, I think, transcend race, culture, politics, everything. And so my, my view on all of that is formulated in everything I do. Because as you know, I do a lot of abstract, I do a lot of some rural stuff, but then I do my music series. So because of that, sometimes I think uh, people who watch us in the creative industry, they want us to do one thing. And I'm just not wired to do that. I, 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 
I was told to do a certain style and stay that course. And I recognized it wouldn't be true to who I am. So mm -hmm. uh, starting in Belcher gave me my rural uh, roots, but it also gives me a, a mindset that if I stay there, it can actually be a little bit heavy. Mm -hmm. So I do my abstracts to, to bring me out of that, mm -hmm. that emotional part. So uh, as true as that is to who I am, uh, I like the other side too. You know, I think that, yes, you definitely do a little bit of, of different styles, but there's definitely a theme. Like you can kind of see a rhythm through your work. And I was interested when I was doing my research that I found that you play the drums. Can you tell us how yeah. that those two things kind of coexist and if there is an element of music rhythm throughout your work? Uh, ironically, you say that because I, I can't listen to music without art and I can't do art without music. It's all art to me. Uh, you, you may not know this, but for 28 years, I didn't play drums or pick up a paintbrush. I just started back about six years ago. Wow. Because of my son, who's now part of Conception. He uh, he was living with me for about two years and going to digital media school. So he was drawing and doing things every day. So I saw him doing it and I, I'm like, you know what? His name is Austin. I said, Austin, I think I want to paint again. And he said, Dad, you should. So I told a friend of mine, Henry Price, who's also my art mentor, I wanted to paint again. He said, okay, right. So he invited me to his house the next day and had paint, brushes, and canvas. And he said, here you go, you have no excuse. And that's kind of how I started painting again. Wow. Uh, without them, without Austin and Henry also pushing me, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Well, I'm glad that you are. I'm glad that you picked it back up. Yeah, so uh, that, and, and I broke both of my wrists on a motorcycle. 25 years ago so wow. for me to be sitting here talking about music and painting i i couldn't have i could not have scripted this to be like this so uh, those two are extensions of who i am but mm -hmm. i didn't paint or play drum for, for 28 years and all of a sudden uh, ooh, okay this is real you know so uh, uh, as much as they are part of my life i think those two things also changed my life mm -hmm. How did it feel when you picked it back up? Did it feel like you never left? Well, I, I could always draw. If you go to see some of my illustrations, I could always draw. I've only had two paint classes in my life in college, art one and art two. Everything else is organic and I say exploratory, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is what we do. Uh, but to pick it back up was so challenging because after the motorcycle wreck, I knew I could do graphic design because I'm on a keyboard. Okay. But to get this mental structure to go from here to here, it was a little challenging, but I knew I had to do it if I was going to get past it. Mm -hmm. So I started drawing again. When I started drawing again back in 80, uh, 89, and I stopped uh, after my wreck, because at the time I was a post office employee. Wow. You didn't know that. Now, I worked for the post office for almost 14 years, but I was doing graphic design in post office. and. Uh, I stopped doing it because I, I was working 18, 20 hours a day. And my mom, who uh, she, uh, she passed six years ago, she would say, what's wrong with you? You're losing weight. <laughs> but I was working so much, I was, I was trying to get to this place. Mm -hmm. And that was to do graphic design, not knowing I'd eventually be a visual artist. So uh, wow. my, my, my life has kind of done this in a way, but uh, the accident changed my life for the better. Because it made me sit down and say, okay, what do you want to do? Mm. So uh, it's it, it's all relative, you know? Right. So tell us about that. You you had this terrible motorcycle accident where you broke both of your wrists. Like you, as somebody yes. who works with their hands, that must have been yes. devastating. Like, how do you come out of that? How, well, and tell us about that experience. Well, uh, it was a, it was a freak accident probably 40 miles per hour, but to avoid an accident, I, I jumped the curb to miss a car, but I held on the bike and it just crushed my wrist. Uh, other than my wrist being broken, you, you never, I, I didn't have a scar on my body. So as much as that was a, uh, a tragic accident, I'm, I'm glad it happened mm -hmm. because it, it made me think about my sons in the middle of the air 
my two boys, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And when they said it happened in a split second, I literally thought about my children while I was in midair. Wow. And only to rest on my knees in this field, and there was a wire neck high. If I had flipped one more time, it could have decapitated me. Ah. So for me, I look for the blessing in that lesson. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, I, I kind of operate with the mindset I'm going to learn, which is why I think art and music never stops because mm -hmm. I'm always thirsting for knowledge and a new technique and a new sound, you know, because the sound dictates what I'm working on. What I listen to dictates how my art gets to canvas. Right. And you said that you, after that accident, you felt like you could face some of the fears that you'd had leading up to it. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, there, there was, I was still working at the post office and doing graphic design, but I wouldn't, I really wasn't so fear. I just was just doing it to make a living. Mm. Uh, now I do this to make a life. Mm. It's so different. So I'm supposed to lead to me, this community, this world, this community better than what, than what I found it. And art to me has given me that that opportunity to do that, you know, because very often uh, some of my friends will tell you, uh, I operate in kind of a both, both world, black and white. I've been able to operate in the middle somehow and have friends from all over. Mm -hmm. So I can be in a room with a bunch of uh, African Americans, a mixed room, or a room full of white people and be comfortable in it because I'm always listening and trying to learn. So for that reason, I think for me as an artist, I have to make sure if the room doesn't look like the world, I need to make sure I'm, I'm doing something to make that change. I really believe I'm here to change the room. Well, I think that's that's kind of how I operate. Yeah. I think you're doing a good job of it, Ron. So one of the things that I read that, um, you know, was, very moving, very touching was that, you know, you have used uh, burlap in your work and yeah. this is to your grandmother was working in the, um, in the crop fields, uh, picking cotton. Um, tell us the, that, that kind of, you know, how you, how you process that, how you, you know, could bring that into your art, what the, what that process looks like. Uh, growing up in, in Belcher, uh, because I saw so much people, you know, they don't understand that not that long ago. My, my grandmother carried me on a cotton sack as she picked cotton. Mind you, I was only probably three, maybe four, but I'm thinking more close to three. I can't really recall, but for some reason, vividly I can see that because I don't always remember a lot. But she would carry me on her cotton sack until I got to be too heavy. Then she said, okay, grandson, you have to walk. So I would walk with her. And I just remember those days of being able to just be out there and be be in the field, probably playing in the dirt or whatever. But it, it, it reminds me of, of what was. Well, what I do with burlap, I try to make what is old brand new. So my abstract pieces reflect that in a way that brings both of my lives from both extremes together. So I use that texture a lot and those pieces generally i don't have any left right now because i have a few people that when they see them and i tell them what what you already know the story mm -hmm. people can buy into that and i i, I credit karen uh, karen labo a lo local artist who always told me the first time she met me she had never seen my artwork and she said where have you been because i was kind of i had a room full of art and no place to put it so my son and i had our first art exhibit here in shreveport together and that's Karen, the first thing she said, you have to tell your story. I'm like, oh, but I don't want to tell people, you know. And I'm realizing now uh, people can buy into a story uh, more vividly if they know who you are. So I've, I've learned that a part of me being on a canvas is what people really want to know about. But if they really can have a conversation with me and get into the mind of how I got there, that's, that's really more important to them especially if they're thinking about collecting the work. Um, so that that burlap series that's always going on is uh, it, 
real de dedication to my grandmother and growing up in Belcher and uh, and making it my art, M making it personal, but able to let it go because how it touches me is different, it's different. than how it touches you. What was your grandmother like? Oh my gosh. Well, she, she had 12 kids. Uh, my mom, my mom was the oldest, uh, and me being the oldest of eight, so I've been around a lot of people all my life. But she was a, a, a gentle soul with firmness, but softness. But she had a she had an innate ability to be able to pull us together better than anything. It, I, I, you know, the the movie, uh, and they talk about the family around the table. At my grandmother's house is where we got around the table. And when we learn as a people to sit and chat at the table, I think the world as a whole, through art, can uh, bind us where everything else breaks us. She sounds like an amazing human being. Oh yeah, she was she was she was she was something. She was something. And and even to this day, she has so much impact on the family unit here as a whole because Everything is about what you think Mo would say. What you think she would say? Would she be uh, uh, hurt? Or would she be happy? Would she, you know, everything references my grandmother on that side because my my, my dad uh, my dad's family was half that side. So, uh, and my mom had an eight children. I had seven. I mean, there were just children everywhere. So uh, I was around a lot of people. So when I got an opportunity to be alone, to draw the paint, I, I made sure I had that space that time. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of love in the comments here. I think we've got the, the Ron Smith fan, uh -huh. uh, fan club is in the house. Um, but one of the things, I see a couple of people here. I love my burlap piece. Uh, it looks like you've got some of your collectors tuning in this morning. That's amazing. What is what is kind of the reaction that you get when when you do share this this story with folks? Um, you know, we we are going to get a little bit, bit more into the events of this week, but you know, one of the things that I've noticed having lived here for twelve years is that the history of the civil rights movement, um, the whole cultural kind of systemic racism, people are so mm -hmm. talk about it. Like it's such a it's amazing to me that it's cut out of certain uh, schools programming, and that this is not a conversation that we're having all the time. How does it? How how does the work impact people when they when they realize that it has this historical context that your grandmother was, you know, out in those fields picking cotton? Uh, I've told people my story about why I do the rural stuff in the bur burlap, and unintentionally, I've had people to weep. And, and I'm thinking, standing like, well, okay, I didn't want you to cry. Mm -hmm. and, and I just remember at least on four occasions, people have cried. And on one particular occasion, one of the collectors here, uh, Nellie and Havert Lyons, I told them the story and they immediately bought a shotgun house from me because she was literally full, you could tell. Mm -hmm. and she said, I want that one. <laughs> Never asked me how much anything costs. She bought into that story mm -hmm. in my life and wanted to invest in me. Mm -hmm. Above that, though, it's ironic, there was a contemporary piece that she said, well, who did that one? <laughs> so I did that one, too. So she was like, so how does your mind right. go from this to that? And I said, I do a shift. I know where my heart is and where I came from, mm -hmm. but I also want to make sure that, that I'm always mindful of where I'm going. And and because of that, that's why I can do different things. I still like to draw, but it's so time consuming doing the pencil work. But it's a it's a major part of who I am. So to be able to do the, the rural stuff and tell a story brings people into a place and it affects people different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, from the crime to the laughter to the people saying, you know what, I want you to do uh, my grandmother's house and we had a barn and can you do do that? And all because I tell them the story of how I grew up. So uh, credit credit back to Karen. They said, tell your story. And, and because of my story runs the gamut, so to speak. Because uh, I've actually chopped cotton myself. I, I have, I've actually, at 
14, 15, 16. I actually used to chop the weeds from the cotton. And people don't even think about that because they're, they're looking at one as artist, as graphic designer, who couldn't have lived in the, in that era. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's so much a part of who I am. Um, and I think when I tell people that, I think it gives them opportunity to, to really buy into my story, but I also say, you know what? I never thought about that. So I like to break people's consciousness to make them realize what you think was actually still is. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, uh, I, I've seen the color and water and white water family. And most people are like, well, no, no you didn't. Yes, I did. Uh, uh, I, I went to high school where, where the mascot was, was a rubber, it was a rubber flag. Uh, and I chose to join the band up there because every other African American had quit because they wanted to change the mascot. But all I knew was playing drums. I joined the band and people followed. I didn't realize I did that until honestly two weeks ago. I didn't realize what change that made even back in 1974 that I went to high school and joined an organization that everybody else who looked like me had left mm -hmm. because of uh, systemic racism mm -hmm. and what was going on in the community. Because at that time, everybody was trying to figure out how we're going to coexist in a world that we have been so divided in. How do you, I mean, you know, you're a teenager, you're coming of age, you're dealing with all these just hormones and usual teenage things. Yeah. And, and then you have this massive, cultural pressure and systemic oppression yeah. like how how do you navigate that how do you come out of that as a well-rounded person like i just uh I, I look back on that and you mentioned my grandmother the she 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 kept that together i think you know my my parents were big busy working my mom was a bus driver my dad was a sharecropper until he uh he actually quit school in the sixth grade to go to work because that's what they did. So I think all of that, as much as I took it to heart, I didn't let it bog me down. But I have a lot of people who bought into me. They called me punchy back then. I had a lot of people who, who bought into the fact that I, I like punchy. I'm going to expose them to things. And that is where the pressure comes from people who are not exposed to things mm -hmm. and those who are. And that is where it really starts. It's being being able to say, look, I'm gonna share this with you. I'm gonna show you this, mm -hmm. which is why I like the music in the, in the art industry because it's a, as much as it's its own society, we believe in sharing. I mean, this could go, uh, this interview could go and take people places that they never thought about, mm -hmm. which is why I love watching uh, when we had the conversation because I learned so much about art, but I also learned a lot about the artists mm -hmm. and how our mind works. But uh, all, all of that growing up, it's molded me to who I am. You know, in uh, October, I'll, I'll be 60 years old. That I can't and, believe. Uh, yeah, I'll be 60 and uh, so I'm on the other side. So what am I going to do now to make a difference for the children and the children and children and children? Because I have, you know, cousins and I have sons that look at what's going on right now and I want to protect them. So the best way I can protect protect them and the people who look like me is to show them that there are options. There's an awareness that goes with this, but there's also an opportunity to change people's lives and their hearts. Because some people just don't respond to uh, what they see. They respond to uh, social media and things like that. But I'm a firm believer that people see you long before they hear you. So mm -hmm. I need to be an example this way before I'm an example this way. Because they don't, they don't know my heart. You know, I see you, but I see Rachel. And I start talking to Rachel. Now we're having a conversation. And uh, we are direct reflections of the people that we surround ourselves with. 
and I, I, I want to make sure that my, uh, that my community knows that as much as that was, I know it is, and there are a lot of things that we have to change, mm -hmm. and it starts here, that it needs to go in here. I really appreciate you, um, you know, your, your openness around this discussion, and I think, you know, like, like you said, these conversations, they, they, they educate me because I think every every artist has such a richness in, in their story, um, you know, particularly this week. And, and I'm grateful that you agreed to come on this week. Um, but we you know we were seeing just this absolute global unrest. And, you know, I, yeah. I, I my heart is hurting for the for the African-American community. And, you know, you're somebody who's lived through this again and again and again and again, right? You know, young, unarmed, black men, shot, no consequences, police brutality. Like it's just repeating and repeating and repeating. As somebody with two young sons or two grown sons now, um, yeah. do you feel that there's a shift in the energy this week? Uh, there's definitely been a, a shift in the last two weeks, I think, that nobody thought possible. Mm -hmm. But when you see a man kill the way George was, hold up. Because this is honestly, this is nothing new, Rachel. The only difference is, like Will Smith said, this is not new. It's just being filmed. Uh, my dad, in retrospect, told me of a story, and my dad just died last year, of how the police officers, the sheriff in the rural community, they didn't have policemen. The sheriff would pull them over for no reason at all, ask them questions, rough them up a little bit, and send them on their way. Mm -hmm. But daddy, why do you say something? Why do you report it? He said, who am I going to report it to? They're going to believe me or they're going to believe him. And that didn't just stop. It's different, but it didn't just stop. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of that. So I can't get as, as angry as I, I am and want to be sometimes. I have to be sometimes the voice of reason and to say, look, how can I make a difference? How can I explain to people who don't look like me what that feels like? Mm -hmm. And these two weeks have been tough. How are your sons doing? So, as a father, Sons. I just want people to say something. I posted that on my page this week and almost did it. But because I said say something, people start speaking up. But before they said something, I had to say something. So with the passion and compassion I have, if I'm going to make a difference, I have to make a difference now. You have to make a difference now. And we have we have to really start talking to each other about our differences. It's okay. Right wing, left wing, people laugh and I say chicken wing. It, it doesn't matter. You know, whatever your your whatever you lean toward, lean toward that. It's okay. But know that there's another side of that story. And know that people can have a difference of they have difference of opinion without being full of hate. Mm -hmm. All white people aren't wrong, all black people aren't criminals, all police officers aren't bad police mm -hmm. officers. But that doesn't negate the fact that they're all mm -hmm. on, on, at, at, at every side. So uh those are conversations that if we don't have, it'll never get any better. And I'm concerned about my children and my children's children, you know. It's ironically say this, and I had a four hour lunch, I mean, dinner with some guys last night concerning this from all different cultures. And we had some of the best uh, conversation that we could have had. But it was a it was a voice of reasoning. And I challenged anybody, I challenged my, my members uh, some years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, in my worship team I played with at church. I said, sit down with people who don't look like you, sit with them at the table. Because until you suck with me, you really don't know me. Mm -hmm. To know me is to eat with me and listen to me. And what we need to really do is be mindful of the fact that for those who believe this, even, even Jesus was 
was surrounded by good people, but he knew who Judas was, but they were at the table. Mm -hmm. A lot of things can be solved at the table. So you brought that emotion out this morning, Rachel. Sorry, I'm sorry, Ron. But look, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. You know, because I'm, I'm, unless people see that, they won't. They won't say something. So uh, maybe that's why I'm here. Maybe yep. the difference that I make is right here on Conception Arts live Facebook feed that uh, I didn't see coming. I didn't see coming. So more, more conversations, more you know, honesty, post yep. story. You know, like you said, relatable. It relates on a, on a human level. You know, touches people's hearts. Like yeah. it's hard to hate when you when you you know can look in somebody's eyes and you know yeah. see, see your pain. And it, one of the things that's been really interesting and disturbing for me um, to see this week was, um, you know, we made the decision that we wanted to just kind of dedicate the next ten days to to. Um, share art by the oh, yeah, I saw that. That's so cool. community. We're like, you know, what do we have? Okay, the assets that we have are platform. You know, we have a platform. So let's just open that up. And yeah. I was I'm shocked. And I and I I know that you don't you you get it. Like you're you won't be shocked, but the pushback that we got yeah. in our inbox just flawed. Just flawed by it. And angry, angry comments. Yeah, it just it absolutely blows my mind. It's like, how can you watch this this series of events that's unfolded and believe that you know anything that we're doing right now to raise this community is is wrong? Right. It's, just, it's, it's so tone deaf and it's so um, infuriating. And I'm a white person. <laughs> and, and and a lot of that has to do with what we've been brought up to believe uh, is what we pour in because what we feed flourishes if it's hate it'll flourish mm -hmm. if it's love it'll flourish but if, if you feed a certain identity a certain thing in your mind and some of it's predicated on how you were raised mm -hmm. but even in that sense be willing to uh, to at least listen to the other side mm -hmm. Because your point of view is not the only point of view. And I think we get so caught up into I, 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 and my, 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 that we forget there's a we, we, we. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about us as a community. Uh, much like this shirt. I, I have a whole, I have a series of shirts that I've done uh, around just pricking our minds to say, at the end of the day, it's a human race. But we cannot negate the fact that my skin tone is different than yours. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that you can do that I can, mm -hmm. all because of my covering. And if, if my covering is what uh, you don't like, is that more about me? Is it more about you? Mm -hmm. So so uh, we have to identify that internally and recognize that, you know what, I have some things, and this is not a just for white people. This is for black people too. Because there's some things that, that we hold on to in the same manner. But uh, when we allow that to uh, uh, blind us to reality, and it took a man dying. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, George's daughter was riding in the neck of his, one of his best friends, and all she said was, my dad is changing the world. That's what she sees because she hadn't seen the video. But uh, the impact that George Floyd's death should not stay on deaf ears. This is not changing this community or this country. This is nationwide, I mean, worldwide, where people are in protest about the injustices that really aren't new to me. But when, when it doesn't affect you, it will infect you. Because mm. if, if, if this happens to Let's say this happens to me, something happened to me, and we're friends. You may love me now, but the effect that my death would have on you after that, it's, it'll be life-changing because my friend Ron is gone. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm not saying that would happen. I'm not speaking that to happen. But imagine how, if you if you listen to me now, how that can be stamped out and, and taken for what it is, and realize, you know, we have to do better. And that's everybody uh, from from all cultures. But we have to understand that I'm a direct result of how I was raised. And if it's different, it's okay. I'm, I just want to grow. I want to be better, not just for me, but for a community that is so diverse now that our children, my, my son's children, it won't matter as much as it does to me. But it doesn't mean that it won't continue to happen. But we have to create an awareness. I shouldn't have a conversation with my boys that my friend who has boys, who's white, doesn't have it here. But I have to. Because at the end of the day, I just want them to make it home safe from work, from dinner, from hanging out with their friends. Get home. Like, Whoa. And when I shared that with a friend, he was like, he never thought about that. He has boys. I said, do you have to have a conversation with them? No, I just, you know, I'm, they're coming home. Well, I don't know that. I don't know that. So, uh, and, and when people hear people's heart, they can really start to kind of like, ooh. Yeah, but, but the effect that that has is directly, I think, attributed to the relationship that you have with the people who don't look like you. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, we have to do better. Yeah, that's true. Oh, Absolutely. You know, one of the things in kind of the pushback this week uh, where they all lives matter people, um, yeah. I, heard a, I heard a great analogy this week, which I, I would love to share. It said, you know, if the if you're if there's a house on fire in a street and you call the, the fire brigade, as we call them in the UK, the, the okay. fire department, <laughs> yeah. you call the fire department and your house is not on fire and you you tell them all houses matter, right? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah, I, I mean, that. I, our, I that. all lives are not on fire right now, right? Right, yeah. Or, that, is so, know, that is so good. Wow. Another analogy was, you know, if you see somebody um, running a, a marathon for breast cancer, you know, all cancers matter. Yeah, but that's not that's <laughs> not the conversation that we're having. You know, that's a conversation, but not for right now. Right. The, you know, it, the it's after weird you say that because we, we, we had that conversation last night. Because the guy we were eating with, he, he's a local uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, mm -hmm. enforcement guy. So his mindset is different than mine. Mm -hmm. We understand that. And he was he was uh, not defending or, or, or trying to negate anything about all lives or black lives. He was just saying, for him, he processes it differently. And I understand that. So the, the, the dialogue we had was, I wish I had what you just said. That was so good. That is so good. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to use that. Uh, it, it's not mine. Like it was on the internet, so I'm not taking credit for that. Oh, okay, okay. But, well, we'll, we'll yeah, it, it, it's, it. it's perfect. It sums it I up. Love it. I love it. So, uh, you know, just a, a very. Um, I don't want to reveal anybody's uh, names or anything, but we had a conversation this week of somebody who responded to a certain piece of work that was that was shared on the platform. Okay. Um, you know, free speech, right? First Amendment. Right. Uh, art is a form of free speech and expression. Um, you know, one of the things that I hadn't examined on this piece was the the detail. And there was there was some some elements of the piece that were um, inciting violence against. Oh, wow. Well, at okay. the time, it's, it's expression. Right. We had a very, very angry email from somebody who's married to a police officer. And yeah it blew up very, very quickly. Like, you know, this is not the answer, which we reviewed it. We, you know, made some decisions and we responded in a, in a very um, professional manner. Um, in the time it took us to respond, it just thing escalated to a point where we were basically very loosely being threatened. Oh. And that's Problem, right? The, the escalation with the hatred yeah. that people see, they, this is like a two dimensional issue, right? It's it's either police lives matter or black lives matter, right? 
right now. Wow. That is staggering to me. That we, that, that people will, again, not go to those conversations. But let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Nobody wants to see people die. Like this is the point. People are not on the streets protesting because they want to murder police officers. That's not what this is about. And, and you know, and sometimes I think we we take it upon ourselves that we are the voices for a particular group. Or, but I'm only the voice of me and my experiences. And some people have a problem being able to separate that, so they group people and link people in a way that that's really unfair. To the individuality of that person, mm -hmm. and, and we, we have to. We, I think we have to make sure that we recognize how you think is how you think. How I create is how I create. You know that uh, I did a piece on COVID mm -hmm. that was dark, but it had some light in it. Which well, has had the same response to the piece that I'm having. I'm working on a piece now that uh, directly involved with with the vision. Uh, religion, uh, all of it. So it'll, but it'll be it'll be in layers where you'll have to look at it. And sometimes we do little pieces like that, the mixed media stuff, especially. You can tell a story, and people can take a story and blow it up. Mm -hmm. But I think all it does it brings real light to who that person actually is. Mm -hmm. So even from creative expression, you you see me in what I do, mm -hmm. and sometimes you respond to a piece differently than somebody standing next to you. But the human, the human emotion is, it's about that person. And it's not one big human emotion. It's for Rachel, it's for Ron. And, and, and I think art and music does that. It, give, it gives us an opportunity to think the way you want to think. And like when she went off and it caused that rift, it's because that's where her mind was. It was never to be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. It's it's to make us all socially conscious of what 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 things we battle and, and the uh, and on both sides. It's not it's not always fair on this side and always fair, on it, but it makes you say, "Oh, I never thought about that." Mm -hmm. Which is what I want art and music for me to do is to say, "Well, you know, I never thought about that." Because I, I on my abstract pieces, you'll find stories and stories. But then you'll also find people. Uh, there's a piece I did called Ancestral Dance. And it's in dedication to my ancestors. You don't see people, but you see people. And they have a covering over them that appears to be angelic. But it was that moment of emotion that I felt that it just, it's um, it kind of reminds me of my, my grandmother also. So it's one of those pieces that kind of, You know, but as much as it was about ancestral part of who I am, there was the joy in the dance. You can, you can, you can kind of feel it. So I, I think art can bring you here, or art can bring you here. Mm -hmm. Which is the piece I just finished. This guy smiling. I don't do a lot of portraits, but I needed to do something fun. So I did a piece of work, and I do a series of nothing but smile. I want people to smile, mm -hmm. even in the course of what we're dealing with. I had to make sure I didn't stay there. Because if not, I could be angry and do nothing but angry work. Do a new COVID piece, to do a new uh, 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 piece on racism, and, and that's all I do. Yeah, but, but what about the fun part? That, what, what about that part that says, hey, I love you, and you love me? We are one big fan. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Beautiful. Ron, I want to know how you feel in the moment when you're creating. Is Are you somebody that has like a, a very systematic approach to your work? Are you somebody who goes in the studio every day? Or do you wait for these emotional moments of uh, inspiration? And how, when you get in the studio, do you feel when you're actually putting paint onto the canvas? Uh, in, my, in my program kind of mindset, uh, I have a, a desk in my in my apartment that for my graphic design mm -hmm. and it has a door. When I'm working on graphic de design, I open the door, I close it. But if I'm working on in the studio, I open or close the door based on that. So I have to kind of compartmentalize what I'm doing because they're both creative, but they're created in different ways. So I close that door when I'm in the studio 
leave that door open. And I close my studio door every night to make sure I don't rush back in there, because I will. I don't paint every day. Uh, I know people that do that. Um, if I painted every day, it would feel forced to me. And I paint in increments, because a lot of my stuff I do is always in layers, especially on the abstract stuff. So I, and it's uh, all acrylic and it needs to dry. It needs, some of it's mixed, but it needs to dry. So ironically, sometimes I don't do it a lot. I can be working on an abstract piece and right next to it is a rule piece. Hmm. And my brain does this. I don't, I don't ask me why. It can, it does, but uh, that's how I work. And it's sometimes inspirational and sometimes it's just, I wanna do this. Cause some of my commission pieces, that's when you really have to work with that. Hmm. So, uh, my mind shifts based on the music and the mission. And the mission is what that piece needs to portray. And that piece changes in the middle, in the middle of me painting. Even if it's a rule piece or realism, I change the technique based on my feeling right. Because the piece I just finished is more uh, Monet looking. It, it's, it's pieces of paint that creates shadows and depths that I'm like, oh, well, I don't blend them. I almost splattered them, you know. So uh, that that mindset changes based on the moment, because it's not not always I'm going to do this piece with green, yellow, and orange. I started that way, but it ended up being purple, black, and orange. You know that kind of thing. So uh, I, I'm that person because I don't think there's a right or wrong way yeah. to do things and do. And people want to kind of artist sometimes. They, well, you just should do this. I love your style. I like people with one way. I love it because I can tell their style. Mm -hmm. I find uh, I find it interesting that sometimes people don't know what they're going to get from me. So mm -hmm. that's that creative side that it, it's kind of challenging. What fun? What do you uh, listen to? What's on your playlist when you are creating? You mentioned music a lot. <clears throat> I've been plugged into something called S Y M L. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Oh but wait, it's, it's kind no, of eclectic no. jazz fusion. Some words. Hold on one second, oh, Robert. Then uh, Shep is having an asthma attack. Ben, what? He's having an asthma attack. Sorry, my cat. Sorry, sorry, my sorry. cat is having an asthma attack. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> Go I ahead. Yeah, he has asthma. I grew out of asthma at fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. No, <laughs> oh, he clearly hasn't. Oh my gosh. He has to have a little inhaler. So sorry about that, folks. So we were talking about playlists. Hold up. The cat has an inhaler. It's a, <laughs> it's like a nebulizer thing. You put the right. it's like a regular inhaler that goes into the block, and then we have to put it around his mouth. And yeah, I didn't hear him. Oh, so. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you. you. Listening to the interview, so she couldn't hear. Him. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. So we're talking about what's on your playlist. Uh, sometimes R and B. Sometimes it's old school. My mom used to listen to a lot of Johnny Taylor and a lot of bluesy stuff. So sometimes it's a mix. I'll hit a button and it'll be a constant mix because I'm not in any, any certain movement at that time. But most of the time it's something that's very uh, serene, very peaceful. But then I'm a big R&B fan, but I love Journey. Uh, but then I love uh, Kataro and Yanni and uh, George Winston. And so my music is so all over the place. People, even when I was growing up, it, they get in my car and like, what are you listening to? Uh, uh, something that I like to listen to. So I love most genres. As long as you're not disrespecting people and calling out people and uh, calling women out of their name, I can listen to it. But uh, uh, that kind of stuff, it runs the gamut. Because I, if I need to infuse a little, little rap in there, then it's, it could be some, uh, oh, Anthony Hamilton, any day of the week. Yeah. Anthony Hamilton, okay. Anthony Hamilton. <laughs> so we have a ton of questions in the comments. So I'm going to take a little bit of a back seat and get okay. to some questions. Um, a lot of folks tuning in this morning. Thank you everybody for being here and supporting Ron. So we're going to go way back to the comments. If you have a question for one, for one, for Ron, <laughs> um, <laughs> clearly I need more coffee. That's my twin. Yeah. <laughs> um, please do jump in. I'm going to try and get to as many of these as we can. So let's see, where are we? Um, a lot of love here, Ron. 
Uh, somebody loves your blessing in the lesson comment. Uh, this is, uh, beautiful from Annie. We cried on. We cried on the porch when Ron delivered the piece. Ron is so generous. Oh, yeah. That's, that's uh, my my white burlap piece that I did. She mm -hmm. saw it, and when I told her the story, she she thought she wanted it. I just took it by, so she mm -hmm. could see it. And in five minutes after talking, she said, "I want it." I want, and she had just purchased a series of music pieces I had done for her uh, uh, Airbnb. So wow. that she added that to a collection. So that's one of my newest collectors. So. That's beautiful. Thank you, Annie, for being a patron. Uh, Pamela Stovell, I've purchased three pieces. I have one on commission. I will forever support him. I was his first model. That's my sister who lives in, in Dallas. Yay, sister. That's awesome. She she came to the second Dallas show. She was there. And I missed <laughs> going to work. She stopped by to, to come support me. That's my, Amazing. that's my big sister, even though she's two years younger. That's awesome. Uh, question from our very own Jen. These types of conversations and stories are so important. I'm so grateful for you sharing your stories and views today, Ron. A deep, heartfelt thank you. Um, so that's not a question, but it's just more love for you. And also you look way too young to be nearly 60. I will agree with that. <laughs> uh, Annie Mill says, one thought has enriched my life. I look at the bur burlap piece and it humbles me. It's more love for me, sister. Thank you for sharing your story. No one sees the scars until after the battle. To me, you are my hero. I love you, my big brother. Come on, this is beautiful. <laughs> Pam just uh, purchased a piece that has burlap strings in it, and it's, wow. it's called Life Threads. It's not layers of burlap, but I, I literally tore the bur burlap. I, I get the burlap, cut it, I wash it, and, and I let it make its own shape, and I'll take some of the strings and I'll attach it to the canvas, and, and make it move. And sometimes I don't know what it's gonna end up like. It just ends up being there. And when I did that one, she saw it and, and bought it. Uh, and she still had, it's still hanging on my wall. Wow. And it's called Life Threads. Uh, that's that's one of those pieces where I mix a little bit of everything. But it's different than some of my other pieces that I've done using burlap, but it was, it was fun. It's wonderful. Uh, okay, question from Jen. Ron. May I ask your opinion as a black man? If a white person wears a shirt that says, I can't breathe, is that an appropriate way to speak out for equality? Or is this something that should be worn by a black or minority person? If this seems like an ignorant question, I ask because I want to learn and make sure if and when I speak, I am not overstepping because of my white privilege. Thank you again for your openness. Wow. I'll be honest with you, that's a tough one. Uh, being a graphic designer, I know what I put on my chest will reflect who I am sometimes. I think as a white person, in my mind, I would support that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not speaking for all black people, but in the minds of some of the people I know, they could easily take offense to it. Like, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're, you're not supporting it. You could possibly be making fun of it. And mm -hmm. I know that wouldn't be your intent, Jimmy. So uh, it's one of those things that I almost see a shirt immediately that said, I support, I can't breathe. Great so, so I think that, that for, for white people, it would be still cool to say, I can't breathe in support, but you, you almost need to control the narrative by saying, I support, very small. Mm -hmm. I support and in that font that they use, I can't breathe. Yeah. It, it, it's obvious when a white person holds up a sign that says Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. But in that, walking around with that, it creates conversation, but sometimes it can also create division. That's just my take. Emma, Emma, uh, hearing you say pencil drawings take longer, do you think this is 
restricts the expression within the work and does time spent within the piece restrict expression? Like maybe the longer it takes, the less the lesser the artistic fire? Great question, Em. Uh, for me, when, I, when I'm using gra graphite, uh, everything is always generally so, so personal for me. When I say it takes so long, it could take me for a piece that's uh, 18 by 24, pencil line, it can take me 30 to 40 hours because I'm using about five different legs. So um, that's my more technical side. So for me, it's almost, if you look at some of the stuff, it becomes almost like a photograph. So it takes more time for me. Not all artists who use graphite takes that long, but for me, it just so, so I can only do that in between doing the other stuff. I'm like, well, I don't want to work on pencil or something. So it, it's it's normally something that I just want to do for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, I'd, I'd rather do something that's going to go to the masses rather than to do something that may be so technical that nobody's going to, uh, that they won't be marketable. Because I'm always thinking about what's marketable too. Even though I'm telling my story sometimes, as artists, we want to tell our story. But sometimes we have to do a commission that we don't want to do. Some, some, sometimes we have to participate in, in a show that's 20 by 20. I'm like, I don't want to work square. But if you right. want to prepare and get your uh, brand out, that's what you do. So sometimes that moment dictates that. And that even uh, goes into being able to do a pencil work. If it's, for me, it's so technical. If, mm. if yeah, I have some stuff, you're like, oh, OK. Because I look back and I'm thinking, that took some time. But I, I never know because I don't work on it straight through. Mm. So on that note, somebody has a question here. Uh, hold on. Uh, I will put it up on the screen, but it, it was basically asking, which style do you prefer to create? Uh, I've been asked that before. Actually, I don't, uh, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a real preference on the style because again, it's based on the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and that moment is generally based on how I'm thinking, how I'm feeling. Like, like now, I don't, I don't want to do any piece that's dark. I'm, I'm working on pieces that are bright and that's not normally what I do. I have a purple and white piece on my wall in the office that I did because I wanted to do something light. Uh, even the piece behind me, uh, as dark as it is, if you saw it in person, you'd see the layers of red that I use to wash. Uh, so as much as I love pencil, I love this. Then as much as I love this, I love doing the rule. So I don't have one thing. And uh, I have a cutout of some musicians I've done that totally different than this. You know, uh, it looks like some artwork I did that they put here on our bridge. I have some artwork that they put, some musicians' uh, icons is mm -hmm. actually on our I-49 overpass here. Wow. But but that's my technical graphic design side. But I did a whole series that looks like cutouts. Mm -hmm. So I, I like doing that too. So uh, that's it. I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm like, would you just do one thing this week? OK, no, I can't. That's amazing. Yeah. So uh, a bunch of people are asking, Ron, when will we see you again? <laughs> uh, I work a lot. And when I'm not working, I'm playing drums. So uh, uh, That's amazing. when when uh, when COVID is not as uh, what it is right now, I think you'll start seeing, not just me, you'll start seeing artists, period. You'll start seeing us at our local art organization and a lot of galleries who support me, too. So. Uh, when when uh, that lets up if not you want to come by my office you know because i have a room here set up my whole office here has my abstract painting mm. all throughout it but i have one room that's dedicated to nothing but my real stuff so so i do have my artwork here now uh i was in a studio with some friends of mine uh, who moved to a new building and i i just felt like it was time for me to take my art and just put it where i work and when people want to come by graphically speaking they can go, hey, I want to see some work. I have a place for them to come. So I would transition. That's awesome. So there's a couple of funny questions here. Uh, there's a few, actually. I'm going to put all three of these together. Do you eat in your creative space? Do you ever dance while you paint? And Ron, are you married? <laughs> 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 
not. It answer not, in whatever order you see fit, Ron. I'm I'm not married, and I I will dance, but I don't dance. If I'm doing anything musically, I'm singing. Because mm. uh, I, I like I'm not a great singer, but I like to sing. I came from a family of singers. My mom was awesome. My mom was a great singer. So uh, oh, wow. that's that's kind of who I am. I don't I don't I don't I will dance, but I don't dance in the studio. I, it might take something away from what I'm doing. But I will sing. I will sing. Maybe not eating and dancing and painting at the same time. That could get right, right. A, little, yeah. a little messy. Um, all right, folks, if anyone has any more questions, do jump in. Um, Ron, I, I think just to, to kind of close this beautiful conversation, which I'm really heartfelt, grateful for, um, I want to know what do you think the role is in this moment of us as creative people, or for you as a black artist, dealing with what's going on. Do you think we have a role and a responsibility to be out there? Because I'm a, I'm a creative in, in a few ways, from graphics to music to mm -hmm. visual arts. I think the creative community as a whole speaks to a, a different group of people. Music binds us so much, art binds us so much that I think we can make change that our uh, people we count on empower, our leaders, they can. And I think music, art, creatives have an opportunity. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure uh, that we uh, continue to create awareness I uh, understand that the possibility. Uh, are you there? Okay. Now, you, now I, I hear you now, but you did go away. Are you back? Okay. Uh, I think we, we have a responsibility as a creative community, uh, whether we want it or not, to uh, change the mindset of people by, by allowing people to be who they are, which is, I think, what we do. Uh, I think we, we have a, a, a level of respect for each other that we don't find out in the masses. You know, uh, I, I think we, we're bound by a, a greater call to make sure that we're aware of that. And uh, I think art and music does that, at least for me. So I know at 59 that I can make a difference. What that is, is to constantly make sure people understand that as much as I'm different, we have more likenesses than we do differences. And that at the root of that is, is, is the heart, you know. And I'm not trying to change your opinion. I'm not even trying to change your heart, but my heart is different based on my experiences. And uh, I think when we take that into a room of creatives, a room of, of musicians or whatever, you know, writers have that responsibility. The creative uh, culture does. Theater, I've, I've acted in a play here a few times. So again, that's another side that I was challenged to do because uh, Angelique Feaster, who's a director here in the theater, said, I wanted you to be in this play. I, I didn't want I didn't want to act, but she thought I could. And I, I think I did okay, but again, I was able to reach somebody differently in the theater than I would at church or at a studio or at a gallery or, or at an art exhibit. So uh, because I move in different ways, I think in every place I go, I don't walk in the room blasting whatever. I see what the room is saying to me, then I respond accordingly. Beautiful report, Ron. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for today. This has been insightful and- Thanks for having me. A pleasure, a pleasure, a pleasure. I want to um, let people know where they can learn more about you. So just give me your website if you can. Uh, RonSmithArtworks.com. Instagram is at Ron Smith Art. All right, so make sure you do go check out Ron's amazing work. Ron, any any potting thoughts? 
uh, be the change that you want to see in people. That's about it. Awesome. All With right. Respect. With respect. <laughs> you know, I have a shirt, just one last thought. I have a shirt I did some 30 years ago. It says respect. And I, I reprinted it. It says not a white thing, not, not a black thing. It's the right thing. And I think when we develop that, like, even though we disagree, I have the utmost respect for who you are and how you think. Wonderful. Thank right. you, Ron. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Rachel. Take care. Bye, everybody. We'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in.